want to welcome you to our Bible study today. Thank you for taking the time to join with us. These studies are what we call Bible survey. That is where we take a book of scripture and give some of the background and an overview of the book. So it's not getting into every individual chapter and every individual teaching of the book, but something of uh, an overview. And so today we're coming to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. And last time when we talked about Genesis, I said that Moses was the penman of each of the books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Old Testament. And I give some evidences of that, but there's some scriptures that give us evidence specifically that the book of Exodus was written by Moses. So again, Moses wrote all of the Pentateuch, but the scripture makes it very clear that Moses is the, the writer of the book of Exodus. So uh, Mark chapter 7 verse 10. Mark chapter 7 verse 10. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother. And I think you all know that that is a quotation of the commandment uh, taken from Exodus chapter 20. And Jesus then makes it clear that that commandment was recorded for us by Moses. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 verse 26. Mark 12, verse 26, says, Touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him? And so the record of the burning bush is found in Mark's, or in the book of Exodus, rather. So the, the account of the burning bush is found in the book of Exodus. And in the book of Mark, Jesus says that it was Moses that recorded that incident about the burning bush and Jesus appearing to Moses there. Now there are other uh, quotations in the Gospels that follow that same line that Moses is the writer of the book. Now where do we get the actual title Exodus? It's drawn from the title of this book in the Greek, Greek Subtugent. So the Subtugent was the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And the Greek title then is Exodus. So it's taken from two Greek words which have to do then with the way out. So it has to do then, this word Exodus has to do with departure, leaving the way out. And of course the great emphasis is that this book describes the way out of Egypt. Uh, interestingly, that word exodus is used in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, and the verse 31, Luke 9, verse 31, who appeared in glory, that is, when Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, and then also Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And the word then exodus is used here and it's emphasizing then Christ our greater Moses, greater than Moses, left this world to be our great captain. Uh, he's speaking here of his decease, his departure, his exodus. And Christ then is this greater than Moses. who le He left this world to be our captain and take us, his people out of the house of bondage. In relation to outlining the, the book of Exodus, I think we could outline the book of Exodus in relation to location. And so in the early part of the book, we have the children of Israel in Egypt. So chapter 1 through to... Uh, partway through chapter 12. Then from that point, chapter 12, verse 33, 
Now through to chapter 18, we have the children of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, so they journeyed to Sinai and the, the time in the wilderness. And then um, the, they arrive at Sinai. And so from chapter 19 through to the end of the book, the children of Israel are at Sinai. So at the beginning, they're in Egypt. Then they leave Egypt and they come to Sinai to receive the law. And they're there then for the rest of the book. Some could also summarize the book of Exodus according to theme. So the, the first chapters have to do with work and liberation. That is, the, the first chapters have to do with this hard labor that the children of Israel were under. But then they were set free. Whereas the latter part then from chapter 12 onwards have to do with worship and the law, worship and the law. Now in the rest of the time then we're going to think of some themes that arise in this book of Exodus. First of all, we see in the book of Exodus at the beginning the bondage of Israel. And so in chapter 1 we see the, the children of Israel as slaves and God is sovereign over that particular matter. It's no accident that the children of Israel are in slavery. In fact, the Lord had made that uh, clear uh, to Abraham, this period of suffering that his descendants would uh, endure. And so there is this bondage, there is this suffering, but as I say, God is sovereign even in that suffering. But then we have the theme of a leader for Israel. And so in the context of chapter 1, you have all of this suffering, but God raises up a leader. Now at the beginning of the book, it may appear that God is going to immediately use that leader to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. And yet that's not the case because it's 40 years later before Moses leads the children of Israel out of Israel. So we have Moses though identified as this leader. He was spared from death in a most miraculous way. And of course that reminds us of how our Saviour was spared from death uh, at the time of his birth in a most miraculous way that he might be preserved to be the great deliverer. Uh, and so our Saviour was preserved like Moses to be that great deliverer of his people. Uh, and we think of how Moses himself points us to Jesus Christ. So Moses was both uh, a prophet, but he also functioned as a king. Now, he wasn't a king in the sense that David was, of course, all of those years later. But yet he was fulfilling something of that role in his leadership and in Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter 18 Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 it says the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me unto him shall ye hearken and in verse 18 I will raise him up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he will speak unto them all that I shall command him. And so just as Moses was this prophet raised up by God, we have a greater than Moses. We have Christ raised up as the great prophet of God. But then we also learn, and most importantly, that there is in the book of Exodus a God for Israel. And at the burning bush, God is revealed then as Jehovah, the great I am. And in Exodus chapter 3 and the verse 13, Exodus chapter 3 and the verse 13, it says, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. You're to tell them 
that the I am that I am hath sent thee. And so this title, the I am Jehovah, it is emphasizing that God is self-existent. He is self-sufficient. He is not in any way reliant upon anyone or anything. And in fact, that is most beautifully portrayed in the burning bush itself, where as Moses looked at the fire in the bush, the fire was not reliant upon a fuel supply in the bush to burn because the bush was not consumed. So the fire, we could say there, there was very miraculously independent of the bush. And it's portraying in a picture form the very thing that God is teaching Moses, that God is the great I am, the self-existent, independent God. But God not only makes himself known to Moses, God is to be revealed and his purpose is to be revealed to people. Exodus chapter 6 verse 7, I will take you to me for a people and I will be to you a God and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And so God is to be known. Chapter 7 and the verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and God does make himself known to his people. There are the sheep that hear the shepherd's voice, but God makes himself known in another way to the ungodly, that they are brought to recognize whether that's in this life or in eternity. Certainly it will be in eternity, but at times even in this life they are brought to recognize the reality of the existence of the great God. Now, just before I move on, thinking about that revelation of God at the burning bush, God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the scriptures make it clear to us that it was actually uh, our Lord Jesus that was appearing in that form of fire to Moses at the burning bush. And in Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, verse 26, Mark 12, verse 26, is touching the dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses, how in the burning bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So uh, this verse obviously is making it clear that it is God that is speaking. He is the God of the the living, it says in the, the verse 27. Now, if we go over to Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, and the verse 30, Acts 7, and the verse 30, it says, When forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord. And that immediately should grab our attention where this uh, individual then is identified as an angel of the Lord because often in the Old Testament the angel of the Lord is Christ appearing in the Old Testament. So the angel of the Lord appeared in a flame of fire in a bush and in verse 35 this Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. God sent this ruler, God sent Moses by the hand of the same angel. And I believe that it is made clear there that it is Jesus Christ that is the one that is in view. Of course, it's God uh, triune that appeared to Moses that revealed himself yet very specifically our Lord Jesus Christ um, we have there an Old Testament appearance of Christ in the Old Testament now another great theme in the book of Exodus is the power of God 
the power of Israel's God. Uh, and surely that is demonstrated in the plagues. Uh, and so we have the plague of blood, the, the plague of frogs and lice, the plague of flies, the, the plague of the, uh, the, the pestilence upon the livestock, the, the boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and then finally the death of the firstborn. And in all of those we see the great power of God. And, and actually, going through them, there is this increase in intensity and severity. In the first three, the Egyptian magicians were competing with Moses. So they were trying to replicate what Moses was doing. And of course, it wasn't Moses himself, but God working through Moses. Uh, so they were imitating. But then they had to acknowledge in Exodus 8 verse 19, this is the finger of God. This is no mere trickery. This is the finger of God. Uh, and in the plagues, God is showing himself uh, as the Almighty and he's sovereign over creation. So, you know, thinking about the, the frogs and the lice and the locusts and so on, God is sovereign over his creation. But also in them, we see God's very special grace to his own people. And so, in some of the accounts of the plagues, we see how the Egyptians suffered terribly. But at the very time that the Egyptians were suffering so terribly, God preserved his own people. So Exodus 9, 26, it's talking about the, the thunder and hail. Exodus 9, 26, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And chapter 10, 23, chapter 10, 23, the, the plague of darkness, they saw not one another. Neither rose up from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And so there you've got very special care over his people. And of course, what beautiful themes that opens up to us, that God not only demonstrates his power against the ungodly, but he is this special preserving grace upon his own. And also under this point of the power of Israel's God, we see God's sovereignty demonstrated in God's dealings with Pharaoh, which is something that Paul takes up in Romans chapter 9, where in the argument that Paul is making in Romans chapter 9, he argues for the great sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign over everything. Romans chapter 9, 17, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now some will reject that and say, Does that mean then that Pharaoh was just a puppet? Not at all. Pharaoh was very happy to be Pharaoh. Pharaoh was very happy to harden his heart. And yet God was sovereign in that. And God would make use even of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart to bring glory to God. So the power of Israel's God. But then another great theme in the book of Exodus is that of redemption, redemption of Israel. And that, of course, is portrayed in the Passover, where in chapter 12, the death of the firstborn was threatened. And, of course, it followed that there was actually the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians. How were the children of Israel preserved? They were preserved uh, through the selection and the death, the application of the blood of the lamb. And as the blood was applied to the doorposts, the, the firstborn of Israel was safe. 
And this is one of the most beautiful gospel pictures in the, in the scriptures themselves. The New Testament confirms that Jesus Christ is our Passover. And so this is not just a little story from the Bible. It is, of course, a story in the Bible. But the Passover story is so clearly pointing us to Jesus Christ. He is the one that dies, has died in the place of his people, that that people might be spared. That lamb had to be without blemish. And so Peter says in 1 Peter 1.19 that Christ is the lamb without blemish and without spot. And so as I've said, this marks what we call redemption. The people went free following the slain of the lamb. They left bondage following the slain of the lamb. There is the gospel that the lamb has been slain, that we might be taken out of bondage. We are set free. And in the Old Testament, the actual Passover event then brought a great transformation in the in the calendar where from that point forward that month the Passover month would be the first month of the year pointing of course to its great significance uh, another great theme in the book of Exodus is guidance guidance of Israel for Israel and that of course is shown in the pillar of cloud and fire where the children of Israel didn't know where they were going, but the way was shown to them by the pillar of cloud and fire. And again, there is there a wonderful picture of our Lord Jesus, who is the guide and protector of his people. He directs and he protects. Then number seven, the preservation of Israel, the preservation of Israel and so at the Red Sea, the Egyptians were coming with the intent of destroying the people of God. But the Lord intervened to spare them. And news of what happened at the Red Sea spread. And so by the time the children of Israel reached the Promised Land, which of course was many years later, um, news of what had happened at the, the Red Sea reached had already reached Jericho. And so Rahab was able to speak of how we know all about what happened at Red Sea, how the Lord worked on your behalf and destroyed the Egyptians. And she was saying then that we are in fear of what the Lord is going to do now that you've come to the promised land, uh, about to cross over the River Jordan and come to Jericho. Uh, so Joshua 2 verse 10, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. Um, and in verse 11 it talks there about how their hearts did melt. They lost all courage because they could see this is not merely Israel doing this. But it is the God of Israel preserving and protecting. The, the Red Sea also provided, that is the Red Sea crossing provided an opportunity for one of the greatest songs that we have in the Bible. And so following the crossing of the Jordan, we have the great song of Moses as well as Miriam, that great song of praise that the horse and the rider has been thrown into the sea. We also have, and this is number eight, the provision for Israel, the provision of Israel. The Lord did not lead the children of Israel into the wilderness and abandon them. He provided for them. So there was water provided at Marah, chapter 15. There was the provision of manna, the bread from heaven. So there was the provision of the manna and the quails for food in the wilderness. There was also water provided from the rock at Rephidim. And then also the provision of victory over the Amalekites, uh, which, uh, as well as the water, is in chapter 17. And in all of those details, there is great typology. Uh, so 
In John chapter 6, Jesus confirms that he is the manna, the bread that has come down from heaven. And so there was literally bread that came from heaven. But Jesus is saying that was looking forward to me. He, that is Jesus, is the rock that was smitten in order that the great water would come forth, the water of salvation, the water of life. And we read of that in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Uh, Christ is the the banner of victory uh, over our enemies. So uh, in that scene where there was the victory over the Amalekites, the Lord is spoken of as Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is our banner. Christ is our banner. He is the one that gives victory over our enemies. And number nine, we have the theme of the governance of Israel. And Moses carried initially a very heavy workload and 70 men then were appointed in chapter 18 to assist him. And of course, this reminds us that the, the work of God uh, has men that God has appointed to rule over the flock of God. They're not to lord over God's heritage, but they do rule. And they are given by God as a gift to the church for the, the governance uh, as well as the teaching of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then number 10, the law revealed to Israel. And so as I've mentioned from chapter 9, well in chapter 19 we have the children of Israel coming to Sinai. And then in chapter 20 we have the giving of the Ten Commandments. And then following that we have other details of the law of God that are given to Moses. And the law of God is often summarized, uh, or is often spoken of, rather, as having three elements to it. So the Old Testament law of God had three elements to it. There was what we call the moral law of God. And the moral law of God was summarized, is summarized, in the Ten Commandments. And so the, the moral law has to do then with God's law for men in all ages. And that law is itself divided into two sections. So the first four commandments have to do with our duty to God and the the second section, our duty to our fellow man. Um, And so the Ten Commandments are a summary of the moral law of God, as I've said. This is for every era and the the moral law shows us that we are sinners because we have all broken that moral law and therefore the law is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Then there is what we call the ceremonial law and in the book of Exodus Moses is given, given details about the tabernacle and its construction, the furniture of the tabernacle, the work of the priests, the clothing of the priests And this is all the ceremonial law. Now, all of that was pointing to Jesus Christ. But since Christ is the fulfillment of the ceremonial law, it has passed away. The ceremonial law is done. And then the third aspect of the law is the civil law. And we talk about the civil law. We're talking about rules that God gave for the children of Israel as they would come to live in the promised land. So there were laws about servants, laws about the building of your house, that there were certain safety requirements, laws about the land, laws about restitution. Now, if you go through some of those laws, those civil laws, you'll find that there's actually very helpful counsel there. But we don't say that those laws are binding upon us today. So they're not binding upon us, though we can certainly learn and see some application from those civil laws. In Genesis chapter 3.15, I mentioned this last time, uh, Genesis 3.15, God gave the promise of a coming Redeemer, who the, the seed of the woman that would crush the head uh, of Satan. 
Christ then is our hope. Now the law was not given as the means of hope for salvation. The law was never given by God as the way of man earning his way to God. And uh, this is something we have to be very clear on because some Bible teachers, when you listen to them, they give the impression, and maybe they intend to give more than an impression, but they certainly give the impression that the Old Testament people were saved by law keeping. Absolutely not impossible. Because they were, like you and I, lawbreakers. So, what is the purpose of the law? Galatians 3 verse 24 the law was our schoolmaster to bring us on to Christ. The law shows us that we are actually law breakers and we need Jesus Christ. And that actually is abundantly clear even in Exodus itself, where as Moses was up the mountain, what did the children of Israel do? They broke the law. They committed idolatry. And so even at the very time the commandments were given, it is absolutely clear that the law condemns us. The law shows us we need a saviour. But praise God then, and this is linked to what we've just talked about, uh, the, the law revealed, we have the theme of God dwelling with his people. And so in the book of Exodus, we have the great theme of the tabernacle. And God gave the instructions for the, the tabernacle. And this, of course, is a, a very large study and a very wonderful study to look at the, the tabernacle, where the tabernacle teaches us, first of all, that sin has cut us off from God. There's that veil. In fact, there's more than one. But there's the veil keeping us out. We are cut off from God. That veil then... And uh, talking about the veil before the holiest of all, it had to be rent in two. And it was rent in two uh, at the time of Christ's death. The way to God is opened through the death of Christ. Sin kept us out, but God has opened up the way. And the tabernacle was seen as God's dwelling place. Uh, God was seen to dwell upon the... The, the mercy seat, the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, that was seen to be God's throne. And so, as I've said then, the, the house of God came to be seen as God's dwelling place. Not that God can be restricted to a building, but God's presence was made known there. Exodus 25 verse 8, Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Now, when we come to the Gospel of John, we have the Word. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And in John 1.14, uh, it talks about the word dwelling among us. And the word there is actually the word tabernacled among us. And so what is the Old Testament tabernacle all about? That Christ would come and dwell with his people. That we are sinners. Our sin would keep us away from God. Our sin would cut us off from God. But Jesus Christ has come to dwell with his people and to provide satisfaction to a holy God that we might then know fellowship with a holy God. The tabernacle also signifies the abiding of the Holy Spirit within the believer, that our bodies become these living temples. And so our, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. And so just as the Lord came to dwell in the tabernacle, and we, we read of that, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, so the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within his people. And uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, all of the items of furniture and all of the clothing of the priest and the high priest, all of this is pointing us uh, to our blessed Lord and his salvation. Uh, going back to what I said at the beginning, uh, the, the word Exodus has to do with the way, the way out. And praise God, there is a way out of bondage 
There is a way into blessing. There is a way into forgiveness. And today, if you know not Christ, what is the book of Exodus saying to you? Leave your Egypt of sin and condemnation. Come to Christ. Come to the great Redeemer. May you do that for your soul's sake. May the Lord bless these thoughts to every heart. Thank you again for watching. May the Lord bless.